Hey everybody, welcome to the Warbots Fitch channel. This weekend I had a sit and chat with Northern Exile from the Northern Exile channel. I'm going to go ahead and put his link in the description down below. He's a great channel to listen to whenever you're painting or you're driving all around. Great guy. I shot some new B-roll footage just for this. So I'm going to go ahead and put that on the background and I'm going to let our chat play. Howdy folks. Welcome to a new 40k rant. It is Tuesday if you're watching this on YouTube, or if you're watching it live on Sunday, good for you, because you're watching it live on Sunday. And uh, thank you very much for supporting me and being here live to support me through this thing we call life. If you're watching on Patreon, double thank you very, very, very much. What you do is imperative to me. So thank you very, very, very much. And you're watching it early on Sunday night. So congratulations to you. If you want early access to all of my videos, make sure you go on the Patreon. If you do so, you get access 48 hours before they go live. And you get to watch it on your own, in your own little seclusion on Patreon. So there you go. And you get I think you get to download it as well and watch it at your own leisure, which is pretty cool. So let's jump in and invite, because today's guest is Warboss Fitz. I'm going to call him again because it dropped him from the call a little bit, a little bit uh, of a while ago. And we're going to get into some really, shall we say, pertinent questions about something called one-page rules and also 3D printing and what Warboss Fitz thinks about it. Because he's got a channel that's very good. It's linked in the description down below. And we can have a little bit of a natter about where the hobby is going in the next 10 to 15 years. Let me just call him now, see if this works. Hello, dude. Hello. There we go, it works. Looks first how look when technology works. We are recording, so don't dox yourself. <laughs> uh, stream, say hello to Warboss Fitz. Say hello in the in the comments in the chat. Thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Chris. How's it going? Gibbert. North, I don't usually watch live. Do you prefer I watch the upload versions of the main channel? Do both. Do both. Watch both. Put me up that algorithm. Anyway. Um, right, dude, what's your channel about and where can we find you? And um, tell people how much of a more chill person you are than my channel. Because if you if you get stressed out by my channel, I do suggest you go and watch Warboss Fit because it's like it's like a soothing chamomile tea after you've had like a straight vodka at, at, at my channel. So tell us what you do over there. Yeah, over here we do uh, one page rules. Um, just pretty much that's what we focus on entirely one page rules we run through the different armies uh, have a new army every week I print paint and play a game tell you what the army does do like uh, you know before I we play the game I go through the army list tell you my thoughts on the different units um, yeah we do that every weekend and then during the week I usually have a game a video on a Wednesday where I can throw out whatever uh, comes to mind so sometimes it's a campaign game that i'm running or sometimes it's a lore idea or it could be totally random that sounds pretty cool man like i i've um often seen like your battle reports are very 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 chill that's something that i i quite appreciate because it's not a lot of the time there is a lot of hysterics in, in like videos about you know just in general about i don't know warhammer things like that uh, is is uh channel is on the screen right now if you guys want to go and subscribe to him it is on the screen right now if you could do me a favor do me a solid over head over and subscribe to warboss fits a lovely chill channel it reminds me of the kind of ambiance remember when you went back to games workshop back in the day and you'd hear some of the old beards or some of the older you know guy, well, older to you guys in the 20s and 30s discussing the hobby and all these really cool things that you could get into that's kind of like what watching his channel is like so i do really suggest you go over there and watch it Especially if you've got a train journey or something, that's when I watch it. It's on the train, different bits like that. And that's why I'm glad to have you on, man. It's really, really cool. So, for those of you on Warboss Fitz's channel who don't know who I am, I'm Northern Exile. Um, I am on here doing a lot of, shall we say, hobby nightmare content, where we, where we generally talk to the community and find out what is going on in the hobby and whether they like what is going on in the hobby or not. Um, I, I worked for Games Workshop for a little bit back in the day. And so I bring a bit of experience there as well into the hobby space, I suppose. And in general, we are a hobby channel where we just vent frustrations about life. And we go on little rants every now and again. And I like to think that our, our rants are good-natured, 
right? We, we don't we don't grift here. We don't go on. We don't have constant negativity. You know, the world is grey and our channel is grey, and that's what I like to say about that as well. Uh, I'm apparently I'm good to watch whilst you're painting. Don't know why that is. I have a voice like two big rocks being ground together over a stove, but there we are. So, so war boss, let me know. Give me please, if you could, right? Three of the main tenets, the main reasons why OPR in your staunch reason is a fantastic war game and why build a whole channel around it. Well, OPR, you, you're probably going to hear some noise as I live in an old house and people are moving around. But um, OPR, uh, the, the big three tenets in my mind is one, alternating activations. Two would be the just imagination that you could put into the game and number three is that it is such a stripped down rule set that it encourages you to make up your own rules to play with your gaming group the best way that you feel the game should be played and you think about price what, what's price like when we go into one page rules well it's it, the price is such a different category than games workshop that I think, you know, I've heard One Page Rules described as the only non-profit wargaming company <laughs> because you can either spend, you can spend as much as you want or you can get into the game for absolutely nothing. Hmm. So that is, that's the big difference I see. Instead of having to go pay one, two, three hundred dollars for a starter set rule books and, you know, models for Warhammer 40k, you can get the free rules you could print out some paper models and you could just start rolling dice today what what i like is that um it does seem really community driven and they do seem to really you, you know i'm gonna say get off on that's not the right it's not the right word but there you go um <laughs> they do seem to get off on community feedback and input um, whilst Games Workshop is an extreme closed shop, get out of our law, stop writing law, stop doing all those things. OPR's not really like that. Um, even if, and they do have law now. I've seen. Um, can you can you expand on that? Do you know anything about it? The, the law of like grim dark future and stuff. Yeah, well, they came up with a lore book, kind of like a baseline for everybody a, a couple months ago mm. with the Grimdark Future World Book. So they've only done the Grimdark Future one. They're going to be having the fantasy one coming out. Uh, they said this month. So sometime this month, they're going to have a fantasy book. Hmm. I, I love this, this galaxy map. And that's really cool. And that's not something you get with 40k that's so nebulous because they want everybody to write in it at all times. Do you know what I mean? But well, this is cool. Yeah. Yeah, what they have here with the galaxy map is they, they've just, because mostly people have asked for it, like, where are the different factions? Like, what should we think about when we put, you know, the storyline together for our army? They have the, the faction map, but they're pretty much still open-ended. Like, it is, a, you can you can travel through different gates to go from one side of the galaxy to the other. Yeah. And you can have just two armies fighting each other. There's no real hard storyline to it okay so what would you say before we go any further into into some of our uh more you know wilder points on the hobby in general what would you say the main drawbacks to opr if there are any and if there aren't any you can say that too that's not a, a cop-out answer well i think the main drawbacks for it right now well what i've seen a lot of people say the main drawbacks are is the armies they feel like feel rather samey um yeah. and some and a lot of people just don't like the way the lore went which i mean you can't you can't please everybody but there's been some vocal people going the lore is bad so i mean they're just starting they're just mm -hmm. starting have they have they stuck to warhammer 40,000 or, or like not one forty thousand in like obviously they can't but are they stuck to one forty thousand in terms of its scale and the inspirations? C can you can you look at this setting and go, ah, that's just custodies, or ah, that's just space marines, or that's just orcs, or whatever? They have they they have like echoes to it, like the custodian guard. You 
can you know draw the parallels to you know the custodies the battle brothers you could draw parallels to the space marines and you know human defense force and you know havoc brothers so it kind of draws parallels there but with their lore they've taken things completely different directions like they do not act in the lore how they act in 40k oh, okay <clears throat> that's cool Like, the big thing in uh, Grimdark Future is that the dwarves are the ones that screwed everything up. How dare they? Dwarves are the greatest thing to ever happen in anywhere. Should be the elves. Always the elves. I, I, I like that there are certain... To me, there are certain, like, keystone points um, in the lore. Like, like, the Civil War here for the Battle Brothers. Do you know what I mean? There are certain 40k run-throughs that are actually nodded to in OPR rather than actually stating you know this this is an, an, an analogy for this and this is an analogy for this um, but I'm guessing OPR if you wanted to create your own law they would be like totally behind that and they'd, they'd say go for it sort of thing kind of like D&D does you know oh yeah absolutely their big thing is that you know this is just a framework go tell your own stories in it okay that's cool that's awesome so how, how long have you been into OPR with now and and do you reckon you got into OPR mainly because it was such a, shall we say, um, how do I put this, untapped field? You know what I mean? You, you, were, you were there at the very start, do you know what I mean? Was that a, a big reason for you to jump in? Um, well, I, mostly the main reason why I got into OPR was that I didn't see any real content on it. They had like maybe one or two YouTubers that, that got into OPR. It was like... You know, about three years ago when I got into OPR and there was no one that was no one that was really telling stories. They had like one or two guys that were like showing off models and showing off armies and maybe a battle report or two. And I was like, this needs somebody that really goes in on it. And I figured, why can't I be that guy? But you saw a gap in the market and that, that's what we want. I think we did a, a thing with um, Out the Circle the other day where we were talking about... Hello, Maka, by the way. I know he, he watches these because um, he's a glutton for punishment. Um, we were talking about uh, we need more people in the Warhammer YouTube space who can actively give an honest opinion without being in Games Workshop's pocket. But I think another really good way of doing that is cutting out 40k altogether and just saying, hey, no, actually, do you know what? We're going to go to the right here. We're going to go completely and we're going to do OPR instead. I think that's a really clever thing that you've done because not only have you got a niche, but it is something that you're you're married to now, and that's going to grow with you and your channel. That's a really clever thing to do. I wish I'd have thought of it actually. Now I'm thinking about it. Um, but that's fantastic. And again, the absolutely. Uh, so I want one thing I wanted to, to say before I forget because I know it's it's going back to a previous point. This star map, right? Is this changing in real time? Like, are we seeing? Let me just put that on the on the screen. Are we seeing the star map actually change with, with like battles that are fought that you can upload and do things like that, or do they have like Kings Workshop do like worldwide campaigns where you know you get into it and and you can now you can update your results and things? What 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 happens here with the map? Well, that star map, like I said, it just came out a few months ago, so it hasn't had a chance to really move around. Mm -hmm. But they do have campaigns that they run on uh, my mini factory on their tribes and things. They do have like narrative campaigns that they put out that will focus on like they create new special characters to put into your army. And the special characters are just pretty much characters you can make with the army generation. They just, you know, put all the stuff together and throw it out there. Like here is your pre-made character. So as far as special characters go, but yeah, they will, I'm assuming, like I don't have any insider information to the company, but I'm assuming that that map will be moving around in the future. That would be a really cool thing. I, I, I love like big narratives in wargaming. I, I think it's something that Games Workshop have really dropped the ball on, to be honest with you. Um, considering the excitement that it brings up, I know that they want to fix results. And that is what has come up in the past, where Games Workshop wants a certain event to happen. The, the way you do that is you write properly. You just write good stories. And so either outcome is a win for you. Because if you go on this, if the Imperials win, you go down this route, which is awesome. If Chaos wins, you go down this route, which is awesome. Do you know what I mean? 
Whereas they tend to just write themselves into a corner and go, right, play the worldwide campaign, but we really want the Imperials to win. Yeah, and it just doesn't work that way. I know the 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 fate of Konor was the one that was out with Games Workshop when I was working there. And uh, it was a known secret <laughs> that we were getting told. We were like, literally, if a Chaos player comes in, either don't let him play or just just give more give the Imperium more wins. Just give the Imperium more wins. We need them to win in the narrative so these sorts of things can happen. Um, then when the actual you know, whole thing with, with the 13th Black Crusade came along, obviously way back in the day, Chaos won and they were, I, I don't know man it, it, there was a lot of grey things going on with Games Workshop and what you were told to do in terms of worldwide campaigns, which was kind of sucky um, I mean, Chaos even Chaos even won so when we all went to Nottingham for, for training, we did, my first event there was all of the managers in the UK playing a massive campaign night so in this one hall, loads of tables were set up, and you would fight Im Imperials versus, you know, whoever, Xenos or Chaos. And uh, Chaos, like, won. Like, hands down. Like, I won my game. I just want to let you know, I won my game. But Chaos won hands down, and still, technically, they, they brought out a technicality and said the Imperials won by, like, by jigging around, you know, certain weights of certain tables and things like that all the time. It was just incredible the way they did it. Um... So hopefully, Grim Dark Future, don't do that, because that would suck. Um, so go on to 3D printing. Let's go on to 3D printing. I mean, for me, 3D printing is, uh, we're not at the advent yet. I call it terminal velocity, you know. And terminal velocity, for me, resembles me being able to go out and purchase a 3D printer that's safe to use at home with very little oversight and print off models that are near to or around the same quality of Games Workshop with just a few tries. I don't think we're there yet, but how close do you think we are to that terminal velocity when it comes to 3D printing in the hobby right now? Well, I'm I'm kind of biased in this answer. I think depending on how much space you have to dedicate it to, to how much space you have to dedicate to the 3D printing, I think we're already there. Mm, okay. Mostly because I have I have a 3D printer. I run a uh, Mars 2 Pro, which was the hotness four years ago. So my machine has been surpassed by a lot. Yeah, I can't even I can't even get on Amazon and order a Mars 2 Pro right now. It's that far out of date compared to the rest of the 3D printing stuff you can get. And um, just the different resins that have come out like the the stuff that i run is very low odor you can't really smell it unless you are right up on top of it the it, it's in a negative pressure room so all the air is naturally flowing out and uh, exhaust out mm. to the outside and uh, as you could just see by what i do on the channel i print an entire army of opr stuff every week mm. so as far as ease of access and, and just getting stuff together for 3D printing, as long as you have a space to dedicate to it, I think we're already there. Do you, so, so in terms of, I hope you don't mind me talking about cost. Do you mind that at all? If I, if I talk about how much these things cost? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so in your setup right now, let, let's say, because I've seen the results, like some of the results that you have. Do you have any pictures, by the way? Because I can just put them on the screen if you want. Um, but like, yeah, do, go ahead. Do, do you, what kind of a price point are we looking at in terms of getting a setup like yours, where we're printing off a reliable army, maybe not once a week, because this is because most people using this stuff, let's be honest, are going to go and use it for Games Workshop games, not OPR. As much as you would like right. OPR, right? So, what kind of a price right, yeah. point are we looking at to get a really good, like, say, I want a Space Marine army right now, right? I want a Space Marine army. Screw your Games Workshop. I don't want to pay for you anymore. How much am I looking at? Well, uh, for the printer, the big thing that you're going to be looking at, like the things that changes the price of the printer, is just the size, which is the amount of stuff that you could pull off at once. So, like my printer that I have right now, I got for two hundred and fifty bucks, mm -hmm. and it has a six point oh eight inch screen on it, so I can get, depending on the size of the models themselves, like Space Marine size, I can get about ten of them per plate. So, I mean, it works for me. Are you going to print more than... You're going to paint more than 10 Space Marines in the four hours it takes to print them? I don't think so. No. no 
close enough. Yeah. yeah not too so, close. so the printer was like 250 bucks. The resin itself, some people like to spend $100 per liter of resin. Um, I'm using Sunlu ABS resin, which is always on some kind of sale on Amazon. I just picked up three kilos of it, which it still seems weird. They sell it in kilograms and not liters. I feel like I'm buying drugs when I say I just got three kilos of resin. But I just got that for 50 bucks, and I have printed three armies out of that so far. I still have half the jug left. Mm. Okay. So the the volume that you print at, like the volume of your models, is going to dictate how much your resin is going to cost you. Okay. So- and then for cleaning the models, I have um, course, two okay. pickle jars or pickle trays. They're just like buckets that you have, you know, screens inside of or screened buckets that you can just dunk stuff in. And then for, you know, I use acetone in there. Some people don't like it. I like acetone. I'm okay with chemicals. It, it gets stuff clean in like 30 seconds. That's cool. Like, like so h- how much space would you say you need? Because I, I, I'm thinking I'm thinking a small shed. Like a, a small... Noel's got the same one as you. <laughs> so the guy, uh, uh, but got, he's a legend, uh, Noel, around these parts. He's, uh, he's just commenting on the stream that he's got the same 3D printer. Um, so that's cool. Um, so in terms of space, are we looking at around, like, I, I would believe a shed, right? We were looking at like a, like a, a six by four, something like that, like, uh, or a, is this something that you would be okay having in the house? Yeah. Something like that. The big, that? yeah. The big thing is going to be, how are you going to like exhaust whatever fumes come off of it? Yeah. Um, like my whole printing setup is on a piece of plywood in my basement, right next to the exhaust fan. It's like. Well, I got stuff going crazy here. I got cats losing their mind. But it's like on a four foot by two foot piece of plywood. Mm-hmm. So that's the whole printing setup. Mm-hmm. That's incredible. So I, I, looking at my costs, when I've been looking at costs of 3D printing, when you said we're already there, would you mean we're already there in terms of personal use per home? Or would you mean we're already there? So my terminal velocity thing is... Um, if you don't have a 3D printer yourself, you have access to somebody else who does have a very good quality 3D printer that for like 20 bucks can print you off half of a Space Marine army, that kind of a thing, to a decent quality standard. Now, standard to me is I can take it to a, not a Games Workshop, but to a, because Games Workshop will know, like I, I, I could pick things out when I was trained there, uh, going to a, an event, another, a normal hobby store with a Black Templar's army and nobody backs an eyelid, do you know what I mean? Would you say we're there? Well, I, I'm i going to say we're there because the local hobby store that I go to, yeah. um, in their back room, you can hear 3D printers buzzing. And I've poked my head behind the curtain going, oh, I have that machine and I know what that's doing. And you'll see 3D printed armies on the board every week. Damn. Now, so in terms of, I saw a graph the other day at Friend Show. I'm not going to put it on the stream because I'm not sure whether it get me into trouble or not. But I, I saw the the um, internal reports of, of finances. I, th- I think they're very similar to the ones you can actually get online just on Google, right? Um, generally trending downwards now because we, we had a, we had a huge spike in the past five years in Games Workshop of um, monetary sales and value over COVID, of course, because obviously everyone's held hostage at home and wants to paint some models. Right. And then we had a huge dip as we all saw that was coming, and it did have a huge dip, but then came back up again around. 2023 and things like that, mainly because new edition of 40k, things like that. But there are only so many silver bullets you can sort of bring out as Games Workshop. There are only so many 10th editions you can throw out there. Um, So I'm curious if we're already there when we're going to see Games Workshop taking a hit on this, because it does seem like it's starting to trend downwards in terms of of their money and their spend. Are you frustrated at all that, that, that the news about 3D printing doesn't seem to have reached the masses? Because I have a lot of people, even on my videos, saying, well, we're not there yet. You know what I mean? It's going to take a long time, 10, 15 years, and then we'll be there and it'll be fine. Uh, that's what I used to think until people who knew better showed me what was cap- what they were capable of. And I was like, holy shit, I need a 3D printer. 
yesterday. Um, and then I've got a friend who does 3D printing, so now I don't need one. But like, again, I've got access to somebody who does, though. Do you know what I'm saying? I've got access to somebody who can go and get me my my um, special pauldrons that I need, or, or, my, or my my bits of war gear that I need, rather than full models. Is it frustrating that? We don't seem to be seeing the effects at Games Workshop just yet because I, I can see a trending downward spiral, but I'm not seeing it just fall off a cliff like I thought was going to happen. But again, we've got a lot of time left, I suppose. Well, first I want to say I don't want to see Games Workshop go under. I don't think the British economy could recover from that, and I like you guys. <laughs> yeah. But um, as, as far as like 3D printing with other people, I think that 3D printing had a stigma in the past that where people would just be like oh well i can't do that that's something that you you know you see guys in big industrial factories pulling off and as word gets out and as more friends of friends pick up 3d printing it's been it's been you know coming to that slowly yeah so I think, and especially because a lot of the comments and things that I see on Games Workshop YouTube stuff or Facebook groups or Reddit is Games Workshop guys will jump all over 3D printing. So I think that they are actively trying to push against it, but it is still gaining ground slowly. Mm, okay. So, so in terms of what, what we're saying here, I don't think, like, I, I'm not saying that this is what you said, because you didn't say this. Um, but in terms of my own opinion, like, I don't want, I also don't want Games Workshop to be out of business. I think that would be a terrible thing for the hobby, right? They're, they're a big, big force in the hobby. Right. And essentially, a lot of people say, well, if Disney were gone, it'd make an animation much better. No, it wouldn't. It'd mean everyone's out of a job, right? I mean, it's just, why would you want that? You would flood the, the labor market. And make sure that you know wages come down, quality of work comes down. No, dude. What I want 3D printing to do is to force Games Workshop to treat their customers better, to value their customers. Right now, they don't. Right now, Games Workshop do not value their customers. I can say that without any shadow of a doubt. Right from the attitude when I was there, from the attitude of staff members who were, who were still there, who who was who were speak to. Friends of mine who are who work for Games Workshop who who don't like the attitude that's prevailing around management and things like that towards the customer base. They don't see 3D printing as a threat from the horse's mouth. They don't care about it. Like they, you know, the, the higher ups don't care about it. Everybody else does. A lot of other people working at Games Workshop, especially in retail, are going, "Oh my God, this is bad." <laughs> like like we, I'm, I'm these models are better than ours. Some of these models, like what's going on, right? I want I want 3D printing to rebalance the scales and say listen we now have an alternative here if you don't treat us properly and you stop with this fear of missing out nonsense and you stop with all this other bullshit that you try to push on us your pricing models right constantly going up I'm sorry no it's ridiculous you need to bring that back down not just freeze it bring it down or other people will step in and take your custom. Do you know what I mean? That's what I want 3D printing to do. Would you say that's a more healthy thing? Or would you say that's still going a bit too far in the other direction? We should just leave 3D printing to get on with it? I, I think that is the healthy way to do it. If we can get Games Workshop to act more like the Games Workshop of the past that I'm sure that most people fell in love with. Uh, back in the day, you know, the 90s, the, the 2000s Games Workshop. If we can get them back to that point to you know respecting the customers and just letting the customers do more we'll say because what games workshop has done a lot in again i think in face of the 3d printing and especially after the whole chapter house incident from from a, you know a decade ago is that they've stripped out a lot of the customization a lot of the imagination a lot of the scratch building because it used to be in White Dwarf, you used to be able to see them. Hey, this is how you build a tank out of a deodorant stick. Yeah. And now that's just that's just gone. They if it's not Games Workshop, it's not anywhere in any of their publications. Everything has to be 100% GW parts, or it doesn't exist to them. And 3D printing is one of those things that you know Games Workshop can still be there. They can still I encourage them to still be there and to put out models, but let some of the customization go to the 3D printing. 
let 3D printers, you know, take that audience. People that want more can get more here, and then let them play in your stores. Well, I mean, they don't play in stores anyways, but let them play in your events. Yeah. <laughs> well, are you ready for some questions, Fitz, from chat? Should we read some of these questions? Um, Owen White. I'm assuming this is for Fitz. Um, how do you feel the Apocalypse large-scale grimdark future battle rules work and compare to other game systems, i.e. Games Workshop, I think he's leaning into there. Uh, the, the large, like a large-scale game of uh, Grimdark Future? Yes. Um, I think that it just runs a whole lot faster than, you know, 40k does. So, whenever we used to have apocalypse games of 40k in the past i would i would just be like okay well i'm gonna be there for 16 hours and maybe get to turn number three <laughs> so with one page rules just the the fast faster gameplay i mean i've ran 10,000 points in my garage in three hours so it it things are a little bit different <laughs> things are different as far as like how the game plays but speed of the game feel of the game I think it's it feels much better on the OPR side, especially when you get to such large rules or such large point values that um, you know you don't have to have your face buried in a rule book for half an hour. I think that's the main selling point of OPR to me is that whenever I've played OPR, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I am um, mm, I'm ready for another game. Once I played a game of OPR, I'm ready to play again. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like. Um, old world slash Age of Sigma, like playing a game like that and then going and playing a Song of Ice and Fire. Once I've played a Song of Ice and Fire, I'm ready to play a game again. I really enjoy that game, right? Um, in, in the in the grim dark fantasy uh, role playing game and bringing out, there is a war gaming element to that, and it works exactly like a Song of Ice and Fire, nice and quick. The battle's over in 45 minutes to an hour. You know, you, you, you're ready to go again. You, you want more. Um, I think a lot of game systems out there are very married to the idea that if you play our game to get your money's worth, you need to be playing a game that's two hours plus long. You know what I mean? That's that's not money's worth to me because as a child, as someone who's who's in, in their teens, your attention span isn't that long. And as somebody who has a job, unless I'm going to like a Horus Heresy event for like, you know, the day, Dude, I've got things to do. Like, I just wanna, I just wanna, I wanna pretend to be a general for a bit, and then you know, have a nice day. Um, but that's just where I am. Yeah, uh, and even, even then, like at a tournament, sometimes it's round number three of a 40k tournament, and I'm just over it. I'm over yeah, I'm going, 40k yeah. entirely. I want to go home. Yeah, I, I, dude, I'm, I'm after one battle, man. Uh, one battle of ninth edition, and uh, to a lesser extent tenth, but definitely ninth. One battle of ninth, I'm done. I was done. Like I, I, two and a half hours in, I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I don't want to stand up anymore. I'm sore. I'm achy. I'm done. I just don't want to do this anymore. Um, I don't. I'm the kind of guy who doesn't play video games for more than an hour and a half, two hours. You know, like so. What I'm gonna do with, and I'd say oh, that's normal. I'm a normal dude. Like I'm, I'm just, I'm somebody who works. I'm somebody who's got other commitments. Sometimes I want to get my hobby. I want to do some hobby, and then I want to go and relax. Right. I don't want it to dominate my entire day. And I think, unfortunately, with the way 40k is going and Games Workshop games are going, they're like, no, 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 you need to treat this as a job or you can go fuck off and do something else. And whereas OPR says, yeah, you're a busy guy. Why don't you jump in, pretend to be a rat general for a while and kill loads of space marine dudes as, as living rats in the far future with laser guns. And uh, we'll see you next time. We'll see you in 45 minutes. <laughs> it's like, yeah, cool, yeah, cool. Right. And I still feel like I've played a game because I'm still doing tactical moves i'm still responding to my opponent and what's going on there are some nail biting finishes to opr and it and it actually resembles every sci-fi movie you've ever seen unlike 40k because in no battle anywhere ever did one army just have their entire turn move and shoot and then the other army stands there patiently waiting for them to respond bollocks doesn't work that way and i just can't get yeah. past it in my head anymore and that makes, in my opinion, that makes OPR a much more, um, I wouldn't say competitive, but a much more interactive rule set is that the you have to 
activates on whatever the board state is on every activation. You can't sit there for 20 minutes and think, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do on my turn. No, it's what is this unit going to do right now to answer what the enemy's unit did right now? Yeah. So the game is a lot more back and forth. It is a lot more... It is a lot more tactically challenging because sometimes, you know, in 40k, you can have this whole plan that you have before you get to the table. Like, my army is going to do this, and the enemy really doesn't play any part in it. In OPR, it's like, my army, we're going to try to do this, but we're going to see what happens (laughs) as the turn goes along. Now, that's what I I really like is the... the, When you're playing OPR, and also A Song of Ice and Fire, because they they have a similar... uh, 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 turn structure i'm not sure if you played that fits but i think you'd really enjoy it um especially because they allow 3d printing too and they, they encourage it on their on their thing even though they sell their own models which is really cool um, and their models are good by the way um it, it it is a reactivity you're telling a story with your opponent do you know what i mean like you're actually engaging a battle of wits the amount of times i've stood there opposite somebody playing 40k and i'm waiting for their turn to finish and i zone out and I just end up doing my doing my saves because my brain's gone, do you know? And they could be doing anything. Mm-hmm. They could be saying, oh, that's a minus three when it's a minus one. Do you know what I mean? I don't care anymore. Like, I'm just done. You know, by, by turn four, uh, I don't care now. Let's just roll this, you know? Um, it, it no, do you know, you know that phenomenon where you're at a 40K tournament and you see people talking through their turns? What would have happened if we had time to finish? That doesn't happen with OPR. <laughs> with OPR, you know, what, you know how it finished. Like, it's finished. You know how it finished. And you know exactly what you did wrong. You know exactly what your opponent did right. And there have been a few times in OPR where I've sat back and not applauded, but shook a guy's hand going, mate, that was really masterful what you just did there. That was really good. How did you do that? How did you win from there? And he'll explain it. And I'm like, of course, that makes sense, right? Whereas in 40k, I'm like, I don't know what this guy just did. And I'm too tired to care. (laughs) I'm just, I'm too tired. I'm done. Right. Um... Yeah, there's no there's no ten thousand bespoke rules for different things. Like how many different Terminator sheets have different rules depending on what army they are in yeah. what detachment? It's like oh oh come on. Mm-hmm. All right, where's Gaz? Says, uh, uh, bro, printing has been good for years. Painted entire armies during COVID. It's only gotten easier and faster now. Anybody wants to do it can. Just need space and a decent computer. Cool, man. Um, I'm sure you agree with that, Fitz. Um, Yep, yep. Owen is back and he says, I do think, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. I do think Etsy sellers aren't helping. I've had several 3D prints leak uncured resin or often wash, rinse, spill out of hollow print, uh, careless and puts people off when you get it all over when you uh, all over you when opening cases. Okay, cool. Some poor sellers anyway. Yep. Have you come across that on, on Etsy and places like that? There are people with 3D printers who perhaps don't know what they're doing. And then they they kind of besmirch the name of 3D printing by, you know, giving away really shoddy products. Well, I've never used Etsy myself just because when I started this, I decided that I was going to jump in like I'm one of those. I'm going to figure it out or I'm going to blow myself up trying. Okay. But with with the Etsy stuff, I have seen lots of people that say they get stuff with, you know, support still on. It's been cured, but there's still resin leaking out. A lot of that... I think is is something that you'll just see in anything that people see that it's people like people making their own Etsy stores see that people are buying stuff. So I'm going to jump in on this and they make stuff that is they just try to get it out the door. They don't care about you as a customer. They care about you as the money you bring in. And then if you complain, they just, you know, whatever. I don't care. I'll go to the next person. Yeah, it's it, it's one of those like dark sides of the free market that anyone can do it but in a certain case not everyone should do it and there's not been enough time to like establish good etsy sellers everybody's got a store right now so you're taking a shot in the dark on who's going to be making your stuff for you i I think that is a really good point in the in the um one thing i've noticed is if you go into etsy and they're not showing pictures of a finished model that's a warning sign if they're just showing you pictures of an STL file on their computer and what it might look like when it gets printed, mm, you know, that's when I'd start to maybe back away and be like, okay. Especially if the model looks too good to be true. There are, there are a lot of Emperor models and, you know, Black Templar models that look fucking amazing. But you know full well 
you know, that's not going to print off that. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm I'm a big proponent of trying to either get trying to either do it yourself or get a friend to do it, someone that you can go to and interact like with on a daily basis because a lot of the 3D printing stuff if they're going for volume on Etsy, a lot of 3D printing stuff it's very nuanced and like failures you might not see until all the way at the end and you know running a new piece is going to take you 20 minutes where an Etsy person they're like I have 50 of these to run out the door in the next week. Good luck on whoever gets them. So, uh, Casual Kraken says, uh, Because of Fitz videos, I, I converted my group of 35 people to play mainly one-page rules. There you go. Uh, group is having fun, and Warhammer is way too bloated. Started playing in 4th edition. There you go, man. Like You're, you're, you're turning the tide somewhat. Um, Excellent. Perfection Hunter says, Everybody I know, except for two people, have fully switched over to OPR only. We are now of the opinion that the people who write Games Workshop's rules are mentally insane. <laughs> well, I, mm, yeah, yeah, mentally insane and under a lot of pressure from higher ups. I, 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 I always stop short of really having a go at the studio at Games Workshop because I know two people who work there, and those people are very overworked, and nearly everything they turn in is thrown back at them at high speed. As not enough, you know, means to be more overpowered. Needs to. Da, 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 da. It's literally that flash gets animation almost, you know, when they're getting zapped. Ah, and then the typing again, right? The, the amount of things that they send to me that are beautifully written and then they're just, it's just chopped up. No, no, that's not this. Now move this rule over to there. The amount of bad decisions in, in 40k that get made because the studio team, the directors of the studio team, take a rule from one unit and think it'll work well from another unit, so they just copy and paste it over without playtesting it. That happens a lot. A lot. <laughs> like I'm, I'm saying, you know, so a lot of the people working at the studio are actually really passionate people who have a lot of uh, gusto and a lot of really, a lot of skill in writing rules. What they don't want to do, and they can't do, is write law, but they're made to do it all of the time because it costs less money. Studio writers who write rules don't want to write law. I can tell you that right now. Maybe one or two of them do, but most of them don't. But they're made to do it because it saves money. That's why all of our books are substandard when they come out. They're substandard. They, they don't work, right? Most of, the, most of the codecs are busted on release. Most of the law is nonsensical when it's on release too, you know, when, it, when it's in a, in a codex. Because these people don't want to be writing law. They're underpaid. And the Games Workshop don't want to spend the money to go and get a black library writer to come in and write the law for them. Because that would be the thing to do, wouldn't it? You know? Um, anyway, anyway. Uh, Noel says, I had an introduction game in Warhammer 40k and one in One Page Rules. And I must say, I didn't finish the 40k game because after 2.5 hours, I didn't know what was happening anymore. So tired I was. And the OPR game lasted for around an hour, and I played a second one straight after. I think that basically says everything you need to know. Uh, check the seller ratings when buying Etsy, says Frank. I know, man. I know. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, e even with the seller ratings, I have seen some bad shops just close up once they get a bad seller rating and just open a new one. So look for the seller rating and then look for a lot of seller ratings. Like Look mm. for a lot of reviews because they could just reset with a new, new name. There are, there are ways to get around the Etsy algorithm to a certain extent. Do you know what I mean? Like there, are, there, are, there are many ways to get around it. Um, but I, I would say, like, in a weird way, the, the, the hobby as we have it right now is we are in a very exciting time because for the first time ever, we, we have tools, real tools, to actually not... I'm going to use the word fight back, but I don't like that terminology but i'm going to use those words because i can't think of any any others because i'm a moron so fighting back against games workshop's presence within the community you can if you don't like the way games workshop do things if you don't like your shall we say um vociferous knowledge of 40k being challenged every single opportunity in a game for three hours straight there are other places you can go do you know what i mean it, it just is what it is. It's over right. there. It is what it is. Um, right. In, instead of fighting back, think of it more like you're liberating your own hobby from the clutches of Games Workshop. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, again, 
As Fitz said before, nobody's saying that games work need to go out of business. We just think that 3D printing is a very good tool to keep people honest. Because that there is now a, a lower barrier to entry, and that's where we are. Um, uh, Kraken says, Northern Exile, what was your favorite armor you printed and why? I don't print armies. I do buy 3D printed armies, and my favorite one was Ogres and Giants. Uh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. In fact, I've got one uh, from Prez, who's, who's one of the, uh, the supporters of the channel. He brought it over from Poland that he printed on his own printer. It's phenomenal. It's a phenomenal model. And it, it's probably going to be the first model I paint when I do the... Um, when I do the, the, the painting streams, because I just love it. I'm, I'm almost scared. Have you ever had one of those things, Fitz, where you're scared to actually paint it? It's, it's that nice? You're like, oh, I might just... I might yeah, just yeah, I had... Um, <laughs> I had a friend of mine who ordered from Major Kill. He got the Major Kill Emperor oh, model, yeah. the 3D printed one, and then he sent it to me, like, hey, you could, print, you could paint this up. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Oh, damn. That, that, that's nerve-wracking when it, it isn't even your model, man. I'd I, I, I just be like, no, I'm sending this back. I, I'll undercoat it for you. No problem. But I'm sending it back. Um, Amu says, the problem is that the 40k codices and rulebooks have been the main means Games Workshop uses to advance the story. That is also a problem. That is also a problem. Um, there is a, a definite issue there when you start charging for the story. And that's something that OPR also has over Games Workshop. It's all free, man. You can you can go read it and read as much as you want over it, and it's all good. Um, ben Brico says, this is the best time to be in the hobby. There is so much you can do by yourself, and there are so many communities that will be a fit for you. It, it took us to go through the dark times, though. Yeah, um, um, yeah, yeah. I think there are many different aspects to the hobby that... One thing I can say, no matter what you're into, in terms of tabletop wargaming, there is a game for you, right? And it, you can even be a chameleon like me. Sometimes I'm, I'm in the mood for some crunchy Horus Heresy. So, you know, I'll, I'll go to that club. There's a club nearby that I like to I like to partake in. And sometimes I'll want to just throw some dice and drink some beer and have some fun as a general. And then I'll, I'll play OPR, right? Uh, OPR is one of those games where you can make it as complex and as crunchy as you want. That's what I really like about it. And that's what I've, I've took out of it for my own game, too. Um, where Taurus Heresy is actually my favourite war game right now. <laughs> I don't know. And it's even more crunchy than 40k. But if you know what you're doing, it's actually a lot a lot quicker than 40k too. Um, I feel like this is the age of indie games in war gaming. So many choices. That's a good... What do you think about that, Fifth? That's a good That's a good statement. Do you reckon this is the age of indie games that we're having in, in our hobby right now? Yeah, it seems like a whole lot of new small creators are coming out with lots of things that they've had time to think about and craft, and then they release it to the world. And they're all great. Um, they might only have, you know, a small community for it, but if you grab part of that community, I mean, a lot of the indie stuff that I've seen is great. Like, there are things that I will be branching out to once I'm done with the full range of OPR armies, just things to throw out there that I think are cool. Uh, Perfection Hunter says you are you are one hundred percent right. You should only ever buy from an Etsy seller who has who. Oh, so you should one hundred percent never buy from an Etsy seller who only shows STLs and no three D prints. I did that mistake and regret it. Support was still on on and lots of other little errors. Yeah, I mean, one thing I will say: if you're an Etsy and you see a three D printed model and the seller is only using STL files to show you stuff. Look at other things they've sent out. They will always have reviews from other customers below, and they normally take photographs. And that's what's got me to go to back away slowly from many sellers. Is that I look at certain models and I'm like, wow, there's no detail on that. That looks like that looks like one of those green army men from back in the day. Do you know what I mean? It's like not good at all. Uh, Rolando says sometimes I man has to forget the world and play a little bit of Baldur's Gate three. <laughs> but each to their own, man. Each to their own. So, is there anything else you want to say, uh, Fitz, to, uh, as we as we go on through through our? Because this is going to be the, the general part of the video. So, is there anything you want to say about the hobby in general, where you think is going in the next five to ten years, and are we generally on a positive or on a negative note in terms of the hobby? Uh, I think that we are generally on a positive note for the hobby. Things are changing. You know, small niche things are starting to become bigger. Games Workshop, their star is fading a little bit. And as as people jump off of the Games Workshop wagon, they tend to fall into the smaller 
groups that are doing you know the up and coming games which i i just want to see people playing war games war games are in my opinion the best hobby in the world and you don't have to play games workshop there's thousands of other games that you could play tens of thousands of models that you could paint just use your imagination and go have fun yeah i think that that's that's the i honestly think that in terms of of games workshop like i mean i've, I've done many other episodes on games workshop where i think they're going and i think they're heading for a for a difficult time because you know we are heading towards a a golden age of do-it-yourself wargaming you know um if you won't do it games workshop we all do it for ourselves sort of a thing and i think as we go into that time they're gonna have to shift to that paradigm i keep saying that shift with that paradigm because it's changing wargaming is changing it's not the same and the people on the ground at games workshop know this too it must be so bloody frustrating to work in retail at games workshop right now to work in the studio on a base level right now and know that the hobby of wargaming as a whole is becoming more do-it-yourself at home it's people are making their own games and making careers by the way back in the day the only way to get a career in wargaming was to work for ian livingstone over at games workshop now you can do it at home i i, I partly fund my own career selling a bloody role-playing game <laughs> like, like when when does that happen right i'm making another one with actual models like like you know and i'm doing that from home on my computer right um so we are rapidly approaching a time when all that's gonna gonna hit a terminal velocity and games workshop are gonna be not screwed but they're gonna have to shift or they're gonna start to really feel it in the wallets and that's where they really don't want to feel it you know right right yeah all righty so is there anything else you want to say to the people before we, we we close the video off and let people go and have a cup of tea or do whatever uh if if case you are interested in opr just swing by my channel we go over all the armies you might find something you like check out onepagerules.com the rules are free the game is free give it a shot you just might like it all righty and if you're over on fitz's channel and you're listening to my dulcet tones for the first time if you want more of me and my ranty ways you can normally hear me from that side of the of the atlantic anyway when i'm shouting my head off but if you can't then my channel is also probably in the description down below and if you don't just search northern exile i'll be around somewhere moaning about something all right love you guys see you later bye now <laughs>